Well, hi again, this is Brian Knight from Pragmatic Works, and today I'm here with Bradley Shack, one of our chief consultants, as well as our trainers at Pragmatic Works. Uh, and today we're here to talk about one of our topics that we talk about often in our classes, Bradley, which is incremental data loads with SIS, and how, what are some of the patterns and design patterns around that. So we wrote up some of the, the you know, worst of good here, I think, in a way. So we start with left outer joints and staging of data. What, is, what does that kind of pattern mean? So really when we talk about incremental loads, what we want to do is not have to bring back the entire data set. You don't want to truncate and load the table if you've got uh, billions and billions of records, potentially. So what, we talk, what we're talk, what we saying when we say we need to stage the data and do a left outer join is essentially we have you know, usually two different servers for okay. your transactional system and your warehouse or your data store, whatever we're trying to sync with. Well, in this case, we'll talk about data warehouse. Okay. So this is our transactional, that's our data warehouse. We want to load maybe a customer dimension table in this case, right? Okay. But you have those on two separate servers. So rather than doing a, a join between these two uh, over a link server, so okay. if we do a left outer join, basically we'll find the values that are null in the right table so we know which ones are new values that aren't in the table right. existing. So rather than doing a join across the link server, we want to take a copy of this and we want to stage that data, the entire data set, over here and then do our join to determine the records that are missing. Uh, so it can be very expensive as far as like transporting potentially gigs and gigs of data over the network. Exactly. But also the left outer join can be a little expensive yeah. also. So you essentially have to look at the table twice, like when, like I said, once to do the entire move and then another time just to do that left join. And the good thing is, the good thing about this is the merge syntax now in T-SQL and, and 08 going forward actually is, is, is pretty advantageous for doing this type of stuff. It handles right. like type 2 dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, the bad thing about this is things like deletes are a little tricky to find in some cases also. Right. You'll miss some of those things if you don't scan the data correctly. Or do a full outer join, maybe. Yeah. Our, our merge syntax. Which could make it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so the pro of this is it works across any kind of platform. This could be Oracle, this could be SQL Server, could be Access to SQL, whatever. Um, the con, of course, is the I.O. Right. So that takes us to our next one, which is a control table. What do you mean by control table? So when we talk about a control table, basically what we have is a table that stores what data we actually moved um, for each time we load the table. Okay. Let me kind of draw this out yeah, to show you what that means. So we might have just an ID over here that would just a one, two, three tell us you know which load we're running on. Okay. We might have a table name here because we need to know which table we're we're looking at. We might have the uh, identity column for that table. Okay. So like uh, the customer might have customer ID one, two, and three. So the uh, table, the ID inside of that table. Okay. Or we might have a date. You know, say why we might have each one ah, of these gotcha. for a particular so call this maybe a, like a table ID in this case, and yep. then like a load ID, so you can kind of identify those. Okay. All right. So what we end up with here is our customer table. And then the table ID may be, that's your identity column inside there. So we load all the data up to customer number eight. So this be the primary key from the source system. In yes, case. exactly. Okay. The other option that you have here is to maybe do a date instead. So we might load this data on 1-15-2012. Okay. And one thing I like to do also is I like to put like the number of rows inserted. Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit of uh, an yeah, audit row here. Met, a little metadata there. Uh, inserts and maybe number of updates or whatever. And yeah. you have those as two new columns here as well. Those are optional. So there's, a, there's two ways that we can really do this. So the first way would be you have one one record in here for each table, and you just continually update that. Okay. So the first time we pull in, we go up to record eight. The second time, we go up to record maybe 35. Gotcha. Um, the other option that you have, rather than updating the existing record, is to just add a new one. So every time we load the customer table, you end up with a second customer record in here. It says uh -huh. I loaded up to customer 35, and that happened on 1-16-2012. So how are we going to read from this in SIS and actually use this in SIS? Okay. So essentially what we'll have... Inside of our SSIS package here is an execute SQL task. And what we're going to do is we're going to go read in the last record inside of this audit table. So that way we know the last time we load everything up through customer number 35. Okay. So we'll store that into a variable here called that customer ID. Okay. And then inside of our execute, or once we have the execute SQL task done, we'll build a data flow to actually read in all the records past customer number 35. Gotcha. So that might look something like this. Maybe a select from customer where customer ID is greater than the question mark, and then you map the question mark to that ah, the variable, uh, variable there. there. Yeah. And then one thing I like to do as well, because the issue that I have here is you have, uh, uh, it, it just takes a long time to run, for example. Mm -hmm. You might, you might, 
have rows that are still coming in during that time. Right. So you can say greater than this time, rows are still pouring in the six floor yep. system. So you might, next time you run this, you might miss a, a piece of a row. So you want to put a qualifier on here, maybe yeah. say and uh, less than something else. Yeah, because ID is less than something else. Or, mm -hmm. or if it's a load date, maybe that, that something else would be when I started the package. Package pass. start time parameters, right, some exactly. of the built in system parameters inside the package. So some kind of window there where you can kind of capture those, those rows. Yep. Um, so that, that's 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 real interesting. So, um, so there is one other piece that we have. To oh, there's something else. Sorry, okay. uh, drawing this up here to begin with. So the other thing that we need to do is either update the existing record inside this table to replace that eight with thirty-five, okay. or in the case of what we're doing here, you know, insert a new record into that table. So we need to always know what what the last record that we gotcha. uh, loaded in was. So we have a cost table again, and we have whatever fifty-five this time instead mm -hmm. of thirty-five. And that's kind of why I like to do dates instead of the identity columns. Right. It's just easier to key on myself. Yeah, uh, and you do the between. The, the issue that we run into, you know, a lot of times ago when we ask people, you know, how do you know that this is, how do you know that your records got updated? So the date column isn't necessarily always something that you can rely on. Maybe it's a modified date that you're trying to pull in, but there's no constraints making the user say, I, I'm always updating this modified date. So that might be a situation where you need to go with the ID. Somebody hopefully has a trigger on that, that call right. arm or some kind of application trigger when they update that. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely prefer to go with the date option too, though, if you can, just so that you can fully qualify that a little bit more. So let's imagine we don't have a date and we don't have an identity column. We've got some other type of identity, some kind of other kind of ID, like a customer ID, which is, <laughs> which is assigned from a the system. How can we key on it then? What, can we, what are our options here with, with change data capture? So one of the nice things about change data capture is, you know, obviously it does require an enterprise edition of SQL Server in okay. 2008 uh, or greater. Um, but what this will allow us to do here is we have this customer table. Okay. And rather than having to pull all the data out of here, what it's going to do when you enable CDC is it's going to create a customer underscore CT table. And that's called a change tracking ah, table. Ah, gotcha. So essentially what this is going to store is all the changes to my base table here. So there's a little log reader application or a log reader uh, job that runs in the background. It's going to read your log file. Okay. It's called the agent job then? Yep. And it's going to move all the records that have changed into the CT table. And what that's going to do is anytime you do an insert, an update, or a delete, it's going to write that over here. So you know everything that's changed inside your table, not just your inserts. Uh -huh. And the really thing about this is it's happening asynchronously. So that agent job is running, could be running every five minutes, but it's sure running constantly. Right. So it's almost like a replication job in a way where it's constantly yep. trying to get out of the transaction while exactly. you're over there. Mm -hmm. How long does it keep it in there? Uh, by default, when you enable it, it's three days, but you can go in there and you can change that to either keep it for uh, less or more time than okay. you like to. You better make sure you get the data out in three days, otherwise right. you're, you're kind of uh, out of luck. Yep. There's just a simple parameter on the job, I believe, that you change on there. So do I still need this this table, a table like this? For, for we this? don't need quite as much detailed information, but you do still need to be able to track the track when the last time that you brought the data in was. So what we can do here is you still really, you know, if you want to keep an audit trail, do that, and okay. then you need to know what table it came from. But we no longer need to have this ID in here. We okay. really only care about you know, when the last time we brought this data in was. The reason for that is this change tracking table works off a log sequence number. And in the background, whenever you enable CDC, we have a log sequence number and a date that you can map together. There's some functions that you essentially feed in the date and it brings you back the log sequence number. So we still need to know when the last time we brought the data in was so that we can feed some of the built-in CDC functions to tell it which where to start looking at uh, to bring in just the change data. And that's like the tip of the iceberg about what CDC can do. It has this whole net change concept, which is right. really amazing to me. But the nice thing about this approach is it's very light touch. Uh, it handles deletes, handles yep. updates. and one of, the, one of the great things is that you can only get your changes out of this table. So you don't ever have to go back to your base table ah. and get that table. So that may be uh, having writes and reads on it all the time, but you can go over here and get that smaller data set and just read the data off of there. So your I.O. cost should go down immensely. Yep. And you can actually move this off onto a separate file group even if you wanted to. I'll tune one for that. So the, so the great thing about this is is how lightweight it is. The con of this is it requires enterprise edition of SQL Server. Right. And it's 08 going forward, so it has to be a SQL Server source system in this case. Correct. But the cool thing is, even if this is a vendor system, it will work there, right? So. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to adjust the schema in any way. It just works. Correct. Uh, so what would be the major pro of this control table then? Uh, the major pro of the control table is it's really easy to set up. You know, it's a very common approach, so a lot of it's probably really easy to maintain for people. 
Um, and also, you don't have to worry about it just coming off a SQL Server. You can have your source be anything other than oh, okay. a SQL Server in that case. So it works across all, uh, all platforms in this yep. case, so DB2 mm -hmm. or whatever. And then, of course, the <laughs> that are joins the probably the least favorite approach. Yeah, but you could a ton and ton of data that you have to throw at it. Yeah, actually. and you can also mimic that in SIS with merge joins or right. lookup transforms, mm -hmm. those kind of things, which are doing the same thing, just about staging the data. Right. Uh, but it's still pretty heavy there also. Yep. And they can, you can see a copy of that, uh, our example of that in our merge uh, on the board. We did our, our, um, our uh, upsert pattern we have on the board. Uh, all right, was there anything else we need to cover? I don't think that's about it. Okay. Well, uh, this, this type of materials was covered in our master's level SIS class. We have uh, this and a lot of other advanced topics. We do this around the country and probably a city near you and also online in our online classes. Uh, we're doing this all, uh, in a city near you in our workshops. You can find uh, by going to our homepage at pragmaticworks.com and then going to learning center and workshops. And you can also find it in their virtual training. Uh, Brad is one of our instructors, and I thank you for coming today. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you for watching this video as well. Thanks. Good night.